as we get started, professional standards certification in the 2024 conference. Keith, I'm gonna let you run the slides, so you're gonna have to move us ahead. Um, <laughs> so we'll start with what is AHEP? So um, AHEP is the Association of Healthcare Emergency Preparedness Professionals. We started this association in 2014. Uh, to provide professionals with uh, the best range of strategic, educational, and operational networking and planning resources that you need to learn to lead and succeed. Um, we truly wanted AHUB to be a resource for all of those that are in this prepare, preparedness, healthcare preparedness field. Uh, and we want to make sure that this, uh, as normally other duties as a side, uh, as assigned, sorry, um, job is supported. And, and so that's really what we wanted to do with, with AHEP. And I think we've, we've so far been able to uh, succeed at that goal. Um, just a side note, who are we? I'm Christy Sanger. Um, I am the uh, co-director of AHEP and we are, um, and I have been with AHAP since its inception. I apologize. I'm getting a little. Bit, I'm getting peppered with some phone calls. <laughs> and I need to <laughs> turn those off. Um, so uh, I have been actually. Keith and I uh, came up with the association together. Um, we we knew that there was a need for an association like this. Um, my background is infection control in the hospital uh, arena and. Uh, back when I did infection control, I leaned heavily on the Association of Infection Control Practitioners um, and other ways known as APIC. And so um, when I came to the world of disaster preparedness, I continually asked all of my colleagues, where is, where is the APIC for this group? We need the APIC for this group. Um, and, uh, my, the answer was always, well, I don't, I don't know where that APEC group is. I don't know that it exists. And so eventually I, I peppered my colleagues with that question enough that Keith finally gave up and said, okay, let's do this. So with that, I'll, I'll let Keith introduce himself. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm Keith Hansen. I, uh, I'm the other uh, co-director with Christy of AHEP and, uh, my background is I was the uh, I was the first ESF-8 coordinator for the state of Nebraska, so I did public health and medical health care response early, early, like in 2002 as we were building those programs. Um, uh, and so I've, I've been at this uh, for a while, so I have that background. And in about 2006, I moved to, I went to Omaha to the University of Nebraska Medical Center and did a bunch of, believe it or not, pandemic business continuity planning. Uh, with folks like PayPal and Ameritrade and some of those larger corporations. And of course, by the time we got to an actual pandemic, all the people that I had worked with were gone. And uh, it was fascinating to have those conversations back then and, and see how that actually turned out uh, 15 years later. But uh, so that's kind of my background. I'm uh, uh, really pleased and proud of this association. The people that are uh, involved in this, the people that helped put this certification together, uh, we have, I, I, I flipped through the screens and I saw uh, a couple of people, uh, Darcy and uh, uh, Deborah Teske, Deb Teske on, on here that helped actually build this certification. And the work that they volunteered to do to build this is astonishing. Uh, the amount of time and effort they put into this for no compensation, no special treatment, no nothing. Um, we have some people that are involved in this association that are incredibly dedicated to this field, and I am been, just couldn't be happier to be working with folks like that. So I'm going to shut up now before I get all slobbery, and we'll, we'll just uh, move on to the next slide. Our, our mission is to move preparedness forward, right? When Christy and I have conversations about the association and what we should do, and should we form a cert or create a certification? Is there one out there that's already working? Is, does this a really a need? Our go to is does this move our profession forward and we feel that this does we feel that the association in general does and that's why we do what we do so i'll let christy talk a little bit about the the membership benefits the kind of nuts and bolts of ahab i guess for those of you that aren't members of ahab um we do provide educational webinars uh on a monthly basis 
uh, those webinars are actually selected by our education committee. Um, and so we have a group of volunteers uh, that are AHAP members that actually get together once a month and plan this education for us. So the education that comes through is stuff that, um, you know, actual healthcare emergency preparedness professionals in the, in the job are requesting and, and determine our, our needs. So uh, that's how we put together our educational webinars. Our annual conference is done exactly the same way. We have a planning committee that uh, goes through all of the abstracts that are submitted by many people that are field healthcare emergency preparedness professionals that are submitting their solutions and their their good work uh, as abstracts to the conference. Um, that's what you'll see at the conference. That's what you always see at the conference. Um, online resources. We have uh, put. To, we have a tools and resources committee um, that also is coming up with continuously working towards and coming up with new tools that can be used um, by the healthcare emergency prepar preparedness professional. Um, that free resources that we put on the website. Um, and we have an online community uh, and networking that is within our member software. Uh, so you name the topic, there is probably a discussion group um, on it. Uh, and so we have that type of community and networking. Uh, we also have mentoring programs, leadership opportunities, and, um, you know, we publish uh, a variety of different things from webinars to, um, you know, an AHAB update each year. And, um, and we also have uh, opportunities for abstracts posters and, and things like that on our, at our actual live event. Um, so those are the, the benefits. Keith, you want to do the next slide? So um, we, and, oh, go ahead. No, that's okay. We're, we're, we're very aware of the fact that we're, AHEP is fascinating and the conference is great, but we feel that probably a lot of people hear about this certification topic. So yeah. we're going to spend a good chunk of time talking about this uh, next. And the, the whole basis of this is one of the issues we have in this field is that we have lots of what I would call organizational standards from CMS or Joint Commission or DNB or whoever your certification uh, uh, licensing, I should say, uh, entity is, but not much for the actual professional. Um, so that's where we started. We started with these, uh, this guide to professional standards for healthcare emergency management, same process as we did with the certification. Lots of volunteers put in a lot of time to uh, create, review, and uh, um, manage this uh, standard. It was developed in, or sorry, released in January of 2022, which means it's two years old, and uh, that means it's also due for a revision. So we'll be starting that in the spring to actually update this and uh, move forward with uh, version two. Go ahead, Christine. So how we got here, so what, what, what did we do to come up with these professional standards? This is definitely not Keith, Keith and Christie's perspective on what professional standards in healthcare emergency management is. Um, we reviewed uh, a number of standards that are in existence currently. Uh, to come up with these professional standards. Again, as Keith mentioned, we are not replacing CMS standards. We're not replacing Joint Commission. This is truly based on what a, a healthcare emergency preparedness professional in the field, the actual person in the field should be uh, knowledgeable of to be able to competently do their job. And so what we reviewed were uh, the, obviously the CMS emergency preparedness rule, uh, a, a number of EMI trainings that are out there, NFPA uh, 1600, uh, NFPA 99, um, NIMS. One of the common things that you can see about all of these um, documents that this professional standards documentation is based on is that all of these things are accessible, they are free, they are not proprietary. If you look, if you want to see where we got information from, you can find it in these documents. There, there's nothing hidden, there's nothing 
Um, nothing that you have to pay for to get this information. So um, we, we felt like that was really important when it came to having these professional standards uh, out there in the world. We want to make sure that they were something that people could really dive deep into without spending a ton of money. And so that's, that's where we went. Yeah, we were very, Christy brings up an excellent point. We want to make this accessible and we want to make, you do not have to be a member. For example, I think the biggest standard that we have is that you do not have to be a member of AF to get certified here with this healthcare emergency manager. You don't have to be a member. Um, we wanted all this stuff accessible. We wanted it uh, available. We wanted it free for people if at all possible. There's not going to be, uh, we will provide training, but you won't have to take it from us. I mean, there, there are things like that that we're trying to make this uh, move the field forward effort. Um, and if it moves AHEP forward at the same time, great. Um, but the primary uh, emphasis is on uh, the field and the people in the field. So these are the 14 competencies we came up with in the 2022 version. All right. So uh, these are the 14 big ones that we, we started with. And uh, we are going to continue to develop these. But the competencies are uh, based upon those uh, documents that Christy uh, just uh, discussed in the previous slide here. Each of these competencies, we needed to find what, what I call reference standards. So when we talk about communications and what somebody should know, where can, where can somebody who wants to be certified with an HCEM get the information on communications that will help them become certified by us? And, and that's, that's listed on our website, and that material is free. You do not have, again, you do not have to buy the material from AAP to, to look at the communications related material and find out what you and learn about what you should know to be a healthcare emergency manager. So, but these are the 14 we started with. And I'm going to let Christy, do you want to explain the rest of these kind of how we, how we went through? Yeah, sure. You're on down. Um, what I'd like to first actually start with is that if you look at the chat, I actually just, sent out the um, link to the professional standards um, on that page within that uh, um, on that on that page that I just sent out the web page there is a, a, a header that says healthcare emergency management professional standards and below that it says downloadable document all you have to do is click on that link it will download the PDF it looks like the picture of what we showed you before um, and it has all of this content within it. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of information in there. And where we focus uh, when it comes to certification is those competencies. Uh, and when you look at the competencies, they are listed here. We have 14 competencies that we have de determined. And when I say we, Again, this was not done with just Christy and Keith making these, these calls. This was something that was reviewed by a large committee. In fact, uh, Keith nor I was the main person that uh, was the one that created this full document. Um, someone named Angie Santiago, who uh, actually played a, a part in uh, creating uh, some of the HIPAA standards of what you're familiar with. I'm sure if you work in healthcare for any uh, manner of time, but she she was the one that actually started creating this document, and then there was a, a large committee of volunteers of healthcare uh, preparedness uh, professionals that have been in the field for a very long time that did a lot of review on this document uh, to get it to where it is today. So the competencies are listed here. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of start with the awareness and training. So one of our competencies that is listed is called awareness and training. Um, the expectation is, is that within that um, competency, um, the awareness and training competency, there is a sub competency to that. And it is underneath, it says create that, that you're as a healthcare emergency Preparedness professionals, you should be able to create a training strategy to educate staff and essential partners of their roles within the emergency management program, all phases of an emergency, and the role of ICS. So that is where we are with the uh, competency, like the sub-competency, I guess, 
what you would say. And I have, okay, I wanted to make sure that I am looking at the same thing as you. Uh, I lost the share. Uh, and then um, underneath that uh, sub, we have a capability and a learning objective. So the capability underneath that sub um, part of the awareness and training is um, to be able to create a training st strategy to educate managers and leaders of their roles during all phases. And then the learning objective is the ability to create a training strategy that educates leadership teams on their roles during all phases. So, and there's multiple learning objectives. So that is kind of how our tiered organization of these professional standards works. And the reason that you need to know that is because if you're thinking about certification, all of these topics, um, all of the competencies is where our questions come from for the uh, actual test for healthcare, healthcare emergency management certification. Uh, and all of those test questions are based on all of these capabilities and learning objectives. So if you have full knowledge and understanding of all of the competencies, and the capabilities and the learning objectives, you will definitely pass this test, right? So um, I, I think that's important to note, uh, and yet also know that there's there's a lot to it. So going back to the competencies, as we go back to that to that list of competencies, there are fourteen. They are all encompassing. If you if you really think about communications as a competency. Um, that, that is a huge topic in itself. Yeah. Um, That's a career field. Communications yeah. is a career field. It's not just it's not just a competency. Yeah. Career field. So so there is a lot of information packed into every single one of these competencies. And not yeah. only that, but we know that there's a lot that's missing. And so version two, we're going to have even more competencies once we start moving into the version two. So right now, as you move forward with considering taking this certification exam, know that those original 14 competencies, that's what the test is based on. We feel strongly that we need to make sure that everything that we have in that exam is referenced back to our capabilities and also referenced back to the material where that capability information came from. Um, yeah. So as we move forward to adding per, uh, to our future additions, maybe business continuity or crisis standards of care, we will loop those competencies to other uh, professional writings uh, and reference. information and credible resources will have that information that you can study as well. Um, prior to taking that exam. So as we move forward, we will have different versions of the exam and it will have more topics and it will have more material within it. Um, I, I don't I do know if I'm saying you might want to take it now because it's only <laughs> going to get more encompassing. <laughs> but I mean, for those of you that are in the field, you know that every day you're learning something. I think that's why a lot of us Day in this field, right? It's it's a continuous opportunity to learn new things, and so um, that that's where we'll be going with that certification as well. Yeah, and I do want to point out on this this list of potential future additions. Uh, I want to emphasize the word potential, right? We have not uh, Chrissy and I are again not making the decision of, in a vacuum about what we will add to the professional standards. Uh, we're going to have this conversation with our committee, and we're going to talk about things like cybersecurity. Is that our gig to answer that, uh, to ask those types of questions and assure that level of knowledge within our certification or does somebody already do that and, and so we don't need to? Or is that really not something that, that we need to go at in any depth? Can we just do a, an, an inch deep on that? So those are the types of conversations we'll have about these. Just because they're on this list doesn't mean they will necessarily automatically be added to future iterations of the professional standards. But this is the list of uh, things that, as you all know, we are a mile wide and an inch deep on this stuff. I joke about five years ago, I couldn't spell cybersecurity. And now uh, it's a major part of what we do. So, uh, and that will continue to happen in our field. That's just, just, just what, that's just the career path we've chosen. 
So this pathway for certification is, uh, again, those domains and competencies, all of them linked to, to reference standards. Uh, we're not pulling questions out of our hat. Uh, all of those questions on the exam, for example, come from reference standards, and honestly, there needs to be some work done on that. There are, uh, um, for our field, there are reference standards that are uh, generic to emergency management, but not specific to healthcare emergency management, and that may need to be created, which is something uh, we're also looking at, is how do we and do we create that kind of um, for lack of a better phrase, Bible of healthcare emergency management that I don't think exists yet. Second step is education. This is an educational, this is an education certification. This is not a skills test. We cannot do that. Uh, we're not going to do that. This is all about knowledge. Um, you may know a lot about training as in the example that Christy just gave, but be a terrible trainer. That's not what we're going to assess. Uh, and I'm not suggesting you're a terrible trainer, but all we're going to assess is knowledge about training principles, not your ability to execute those. Uh, I, we talked about it. I'm just not sure how you do that at scale. So <clears throat> that's kind of where we are with education and then certification. The certification not only uh, is part of the uh, knowledge, uh, but we also uh, have requirements for, especially at the what we call the mastery level uh, documentation that you need to submit to show that you are um, have in-depth knowledge of the area that we're talking about. And then the guiding principles that we've mentioned already are we want everything uh, in terms of our information and our uh, study guides and everything else we want it we want it to be credible we did not again did not create this in a vacuum uh, we want it to be attainable people should be able to get this we want it accessible people should uh, be able to do this from wherever they are as a matter of fact we're actually having conversations with some folks in canada about how we translate this from uh, u.s extremely u.s centric uh, certification exam at this point uh, to something that can be Canadian and uh, international uh, also. So we also want it to be affordable. We do have to charge for it, but we're trying to keep that uh, cost point down as far as we can. And we think this should be widely adopted. We need, in order to professionalize the association, we need some uh, assurance that the, that the people in it uh, are professionals. And this is a natural step that uh, many other organizations have taken and many other uh, for, for lack of a better phrase, jobs in healthcare have gone down this path, and we think it's time for for our folks to go down this path too. Go ahead, Keith. Um, yeah, just to to interrupt, um, one of the things that I did just pop into the chat is the uh, pre read list that we have, and it, it is within our website. Um, but this is a, a direct link to the PDF. Um, so when we say that we have accessible and uh, attainable education, um, or not education, but opportunities of, of getting this base knowledge. Um, everything on our recommended pre-certification education and courses list is free. Um, it should not be something that you should have to pay for. This list includes a lot of FEMA trainings, um, a lot of EMI um, documentation, uh, a lot of NFPA um, documentation and codes. And uh, it, there's a lot to read. You could read and read and read on all the information that we have here, um, but know that it's accessible. It's, it's something that you can get your hands on. Uh, and we have every single question that we have on the certification is linked somewhere into some one of these documents. Uh, and we we have uh, a spreadsheet that that literally has those links uh, documented. Um, so um, that that's how those test questions are organized. So back to the slide deck, why is certification and important? Um, we've kind of already gone over that we expect this to advance the practice in our profession overall. Um, we feel that strongly that it's important to continuously learn and develop and improve upon our profession and upon our education. Um, we think it's important to recognize expertise. Um, we want folks to, that do get certified to have that designation and people in this field to say, 
wow, that person is knowledgeable and is competent and I would hire that person for this job or I would ask them to mentor me on whatever topic it is that they need to be mentored. There, there's a variety of things that come with being certified and especially at a mastery level, um, we didn't make that easy on purpose. Um, it's not an easy certification to obtain, um, but we want it to be meaningful. So, uh, and recognize that expertise. And so we'd also like to build this community of healthcare emergency preparedness providers. So the certified healthcare emergency manager is a professional dedicated to the administration of organizational risks from human, natural, or technological threats. Um, the HCEM will be qualified to interface with hospitals, public health agencies, and emergency management. And this HCEM designation is going to be provided exclusively by us. Um, and it's the professional designation that uh, will demonstrate that an individual has met or exceeded our stringent competencies and professional practices. So that's what we intend to uh, have the HCEM mean and be meaningful for. <clears throat> yeah, there are other uh, there are other there are other um, certifications that you can get for emergency management. This is not them. This is specific to healthcare. Um, so that that was our goal, and that was uh, how it ended up being. This is very much people centered. Um, we want people, healthcare emergency managers, to be able to de demonstrate a continuity of uh, clinical, administrative uh, uh, support, all the operations within a healthcare facility, regardless of what the healthcare facility is, how big or small it is. Uh, our healthcare emergency managers should be able to provide that continuity. We want to. Uh, them to be able to balance competing priorities and requirements, which I think all of us, uh, I love to say all of you do uh, on a daily basis. And uh, they need to be a reliable advisor to a healthcare organization. And uh, we, we, we became, um, we came under the spotlight uh, during COVID, whether we were before or not. Uh, but we uh, now, to some extent, uh, have some credibility with uh, our uh, C-suites in our healthcare facilities. And the question is, how do we uh, leverage that? How do we build upon that? And how do we increase our influence in terms of disaster response and readiness uh, within these facilities? The test. This is probably, if we'd have started with this, you'd have probably been happy and jumped off as soon as we were done. And I wouldn't have blamed you a bit. Are you so, waiting for me to go? <laughs> no, I think, we, I think we need to tag team this one. So, uh, you know, again, this was built by a team. The examination was built by a team. We, we had people uh, find in one of their uh, uh, performance standards that they were interested in or, or felt they were had some, a, a good deal of expertise in. They wrote the questions. They were then reviewed by someone else. And then they, were, they also went under a secondary review. Uh, we also had them... Um, well, I guess that goes for the next one. Uh, reviewed twice, and then we're also in the in the process of our third pilot test right now. We did one uh, early summer, we did one this fall, and now we're going to do one in the next week or so. Uh, we're eliminating bad questions. We are uh, revising questions, hopefully revising questions that are unclear. Uh, it's it's a process, and this is a process we will continue to go through. This is not a one and done. As we add questions, as we add competencies, uh, we will continue to, to do this process, although the pilot program is ending. We will offer this exam in uh, totality uh, in February, end of February uh, this year. Yep. So, yep. Um, that, will be, that will be done. Do you wanna do logistics? Yeah, so we have, we have 100 questions on the test. We'll give you an hour and a half to complete the exam. Uh, the passing score is 80%. Just because you pass the test doesn't mean you're certified. Uh, there is a variety of uh, things that are in addition to just the test that we'll go over in the upcoming slides. Um, for those of you that are asking questions, just uh, on a side note in the chat or in the Q&A, um, I'm going to come back to those. Uh, we might end up answering some of that information as we move forward here, but um, 
feel free to continue to add your questions in the in the, um, in the Q and A box. Um, but as we uh, continue to work on the testing, um, we actually have a requirement for the mastery level uh, certification that every master applicant needs to write three test questions of their own. Um, we're doing this um, so that every mastery level test uh, or certifi certificate um, will get an opportunity to try their hand at writing a test question. We want them to show that they do have um, knowledge beyond just the basics. And uh, we know that those individuals that are at that level might have some really good questions um, that would link to resources that maybe our committee that is current and in existence right now maybe hasn't heard of, hasn't, hasn't been aware of. Maybe it's something that is new. Um, and as we move forward with additional competencies in the a newer versions um, of the professional standards, we're going to rely on some of those mastery level applicants to um, start submitting uh, test questions uh, to us and, and allow for our committee to continue to review those. Um, so we'll also have additional questions for all the, all the additional competencies. So again, this test is gonna continuously evolve. Yeah, and those additional questions that we want the mastery level people, this is not, it's not about, do you know how to write a test question? That's not what we're getting at. We're asking our mastery level, again, mastery level people to take a deeper dive into one of the competencies and uh, think about, think hard about what other people need to know within that competency area and, and write a question about it. So it's not about ability to write a test question. We will help you clean up the test question we will, if, if that's not the issue, it's the deep dive, it's the hard thinking, it's a contribution back to the field. So moving on, we have uh, three levels of certification. We have a basic, a professional and a mastery. Um, these three different levels come with different requirements. Um, all of these are published on our website and we'll put the link in the chat box as well. Um, but the basic requires at least one year of experience in healthcare preparedness. Um, that, that has been uh, something that we have pretty adamantly uh, determined, healthcare preparedness. Um, that being said, um, healthcare preparedness means a lot of things to a lot of different people, um, but we expect that healthcare preparedness experience. This is not just a generic emergency management certification. We really are focused in on healthcare. Um, the professional level has five years expectation of experience. The mastery level has 10 years expectation of experience. All of that experience needs to be able to be shown uh, through resumes and um, a variety of different requirements. Um, so we're not just taking you at your word. We're going to take a look at that experience. Um, additional experience requirements, um, we, would expect a basic level to have experience in um, a facility disaster response or an exercise and be able to be able to document that that happened. Um, going for the professional level, it would expect the expectation would be two or more uh, responses or exercises and that and that you have participated on a planning team or um, a exercise planning team or a disaster planning team. Um, or a disaster response team. I think that's not completely clear in there, but we'll fix that. Um, and then moving on to the mastery level, uh, that documented participation uh, includes five or more. And uh, the expectation is that you've served as um, a leader, not just participated on teams, but actually served as a leader within those teams um, or facility. Uh, the prerequisites are all the same. Uh, the prerequisites, there's a number of prerequisites required. Um, they're required courses. Uh, actually, if you skip through the next slide, Keith, and go to the next one, we'll look at that quick. Um, these are the courses that the expectation is that you have uh, taken prior to getting certified. So we will 
uh, check those. Uh, we also have an attestation form that uh, you will need to fill out to uh, attest that you have completed those. And then with the mastery level, Casey, if you can go back that one slide, the mastery level is the field contributions. Um, and so the expectation for that mastery level is a number of field contributions that incl include presentations of original content uh, on whatever competency is within your purview of expertise or a publication um, and the submission of those written uh, certification exam questions uh, on your uh, competency of choice. So uh, it is a deeper dive. There are more requirements. There will be more review uh, to the application. Um, but again, the mastery level is in intentionally harder than the basic level. Yeah, Christy said this before, and, and I would like to reiterate it real quick. This We made this not, we don't want this to be easy. If this be, if this looks and is easy, then it becomes meaningless. When we, when I say, I think you are a master of your field, I want to mean it. Um, and I think that that certification should mean something. And I'm looking at a picture of a gentleman on the screen who uh, actually has his HCEM now. He was part of our pilot project, and uh, uh, he is the personification of what I'm talking about right now. He knows his stuff. He's been at it a long time. He's a, a fantastic resource, not only to us, but to others in the field. He's mentored people. He's mentored people in my state. Um, uh, I'm going to just call you out, Dave. Dave McGraw is um, uh, one of our early HCEMMs, and if you're looking for what that HCEMM looks like, uh, talk to Dave. He's the guy. Um, anything else you want to cover about this one, Christy? No, nope, we already did. So um, moving on to support, submitting supporting document, and I'm going to buzz through the end of some of this because I know we have questions and people want uh, to get to the questions and answers. Um, so once you take the test and we know that you've passed the test, then you go to the application um, where you submit all of that documentation for review. We don't want you to be submitting and, and having that expense to submit that documentation until we know you actually have passed the course because um, there is a cost associated with submitting that documentation because there is a cost to us reviewing that documentation. Um, and so, you know, I, I, in a perfect world, I'd love to make everything free, but um, we, we aren't grant funded. We don't have supporting funds that allow us to give things away for free. So um, we, we do need to pass some of the costs on to you, but we're trying our hardest to keep it as low as we can. Um, healthcare people love algorithms. I'm a healthcare people, so I love algorithms. So this was one of the first things I wanted to do with the certification is to show, show the pathway. So uh, it makes more sense in my head to understand it this way. So we are going to host this exam biannually, twice a year, we're going to allow and open this exam. It is going to either be online or once a year at the conference. We're gonna do it live and in person. And if people want to do it live and in person and in a room with other people with pen to paper, they are more than willing, like we are more than willing to provide that experience for them, but we will only be able to do that once a year um, at the, the in-person event. Um, so uh, otherwise it will be open twice a year uh, online and open uh, online. So you can do it in the comfort of your, your home. Um, so you register, you take the exam, you pass the exam, uh, you submit your application materials, the application is reviewed uh, and by the committee, uh, and then the certification status will be sent to you within four to six weeks, uh, then it will be approved and you will be considered certified. Uh, there will be a certificate involved. Um, for for Dave McGraw, he, he would raise his hand and say, no, he hasn't gotten his certificate yet. Yeah, we're going to get that in the mail. We're still working on processes. Um, so this is still new. Um, but by the time we uh, by the time we have this uh, in place in February, uh, yes, we will have all of that in place. Um, if you don't pass the exam, you can register for the next exam when we have a next exam. 
Uh, if you're not approved uh, when you're reviewed by the committee, um, you may resubmit the application materials within a year. Um, if you feel that that it was something that, you know, you just, I forgot to do this, or I didn't submit this, or I understand now what they were looking for, um, that is another option. Uh, the next slide has the fees associated with uh, the certification, the exam, to register for the exam is $200, and then to submit your application for the review of the material is uh tiered and based on how much time and energy and effort it's going to take to actually review those applications. And um, so that's, that's where we ended up with the fees. It will be less expensive to get your basic level certification uh, than it will be to get your mastery level certification. Uh, annual recertification, we, um, we had a uh, a lot of input and a lot of discussion on this. And um, we considered every point of discussion that was given, but it was determined in the end that uh, we would recertify annually with an annual fee of $100 rather than uh, uh, you know every two or three years and have a $500 recertification fee. Uh, we decided it, it was going to, in the end, uh, be easier to manage from our end and easier to manage from the applicant's end to resubmit those recertification um, applications on an annual basis for a lower fee uh, and, and continually be able to do that. Um, and, and sometimes that, that's something that uh, organizations will pay for if you can do that on an annual basis, but they don't want to do that you know, every five years, because they know, you know, after, after a year, you could leave their organization. So that was some of the feedback and the discussion that was had, uh, as we made that determination. So um, moving on to the next slide, uh, what's to come, um, we are going to review the and and come up with the next version of the professional standards starting in the spring. Um, and so we are looking forward to uh, revising those professional standards. Uh, one of the questions that I had uh, in, in the chat or in the Q&A was asking about mitigation within our domain. Um, it was mentioned in one part that there's mitigation, there, there's, but in, in the end, the domains don't list mitigation. Um, and that is one example of why we need to revise these professional standards. It was something that was put together and that was an error, it needed to be fixed. But um, the re in the original, original version of this, mitigation was one of the domains. And uh, in the end, uh, after a number of reviews, it was, de it was decided that mitigation was part of preparedness. And so that's how we ended up within that domain. And so, um, that's just one example of why we need to review this and come up with a version two. Um, there are a variety of things that need to be changed that have been recognized within the last year. Um, and then obviously we need more, more competencies because this field is continuously growing. Um, we hope to be able to at least, at the very least uh, recommend education that gets developed um, probably by, not by us, but something that we will review and approve as something that we um, do acknowledge as something that would, would prepare somebody for um, certification or prepare somebody um, to be knowledgeable about the professional standards. Um, so we, we hope that there will to be in the future webinars and virtual trainings and in-person trainings and a study guide and hopefully even that big reference document where all of the information um, is in one big document versus having to go to uh, our our pre-read list where there is you know tons and tons of information but it's scattered all over the place we would love to see a book that that you know encompassed everything but it's not there yet um, we'll get there. We we hope this profession will come to that, and uh, you know we know it will. We've got a lot of ambitious folks in this in this field, and it's it's moving forward all the time. 
And I think oh, moving into the conference, 2024 conference, um, all the information is online. Uh, we'll put that those links in the um, chat as well. It's in Dallas this year. It's on February 27th and 28th. That certification exam in person is going to be on the 26th. Um, early bird registration uh, discount is through January 19th. So you still have time to get in on that early bird discount. Um, some of the agenda, uh, we are really going to focus a lot on some leadership um, within this field because we know that that is uh, high demand and really important. Um, we are, uh, here's a couple or just a, a short list of some of the things that are on the agenda. I don't need to read those to you, but um, I, I have no doubt in my mind that it will be a, a, a conference you won't want to miss. Uh, if you like 